Welcome back to Network Analysis. Your instructor is now refreshed, uh, having had a cup of coffee and a little snack. So I am now going to take you to a cruise of Network Analysis. Network Analysis has a very clear beginning as a discipline. Who had the idea of drawing networks? That person was Leonard Euler. Leonard Euler, back in 1735, proved a problem using network thinking. And he was the first person in the history of humanity who has thought about relationships in an abstract sense. Not about points and their properties, not about areas, but about relationships. The problem he solved is a problem known as the Bridges of Königsberg. And today I'll tell you about this problem and I will tell you the solution at the la very last slide of my presentation. So I'm not actually going to, I want you to think a little bit about this, this problem. If you think you have thought enough about this with pencil and paper, then you can see the solution at the very uh, final slide which the very final slide and the other slides are posted on Blackboard. So here's the problem. The city of Königsberg that still exists, uh, it's now called uh, uh, Kaliningrad, uh, but back in the 18th century it was called Königsberg. Königsberg is sitting on a river called Pregel, and that river uh, is going right through the city. Here is a map of Königsberg, uh, as it was in the 18th century. Uh, the city is split into different areas, and the areas are connected by bridges. And you can see here the, the river Pregel and the bridges. Well, people in, in Königsberg like walking around the city like we do now today, you know, walking around Chicago. Chicago is really no different in this respect. We have lots of bridges, we get the loop, the, the, the lake. And that was Königsberg as well. The, the, the citizens of the city had this really interesting and curious problem, no practical application, but nobody could really figure this out. Essentially, the question was this. Can you walk around the city with crossing all the bridges, but not crossing any bridge more than once? So you want to cross all the bridges in the city, but not cross any of them more than once. So exactly once. You don't have to start and go back to the same place. Uh, that makes the problem a little bit more uh, special. You just have to start at some point in the city, cross all the bridges, but not cross any of the bridges more than once. So Euler's solution to this problem created network analysis. <clears throat> what he did was the following. He represented every piece of land with a node. So every piece of land is a node. It does not matter how much territory it has, how, much, uh, how many people are living there, is it an important piece of territory or not, is it just a field uh, or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, if there is a bridge that's going to it and it's solid, then it's going to be a node. And here's a graph that he created. I'm going to call this node center, north, west, and south. C-N-W-S. So what is the center? Center on the map is represented by one node. And it has not one but multiple connections to, to the north part of the city. In fact, there are exactly two bridges going from center to north, and you can see them on the map and also on the graph. This is a little bit of a special situation. This is a situation where you have multiple relationship from a single node to another node. And this is allowed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is allowed. Uh, most network analysis, I would say, does not is not particularly interested in this case, uh, but uh, we are... Uh, Actually, I should take that back. This is a situation that's uh, not very common in social networks, but it's common in many other situations. 
and uh, you can think of it in a somewhat mathematical sense as a weight of two. So when you have one bridge from point to A to point B, that means uh, a relationship of weight one. Uh, but if you have two bridges, it's like a relationship of weight two. And there, there could be potentially situations where the weight is three, four, and five. That would correspond to a situation where there's three, four, and five bridges. But it's useful to think of it as individual edges. So you could have two edges going from C to N. All right, well, let's complete this network. <clears throat> How many bridges are going from, uh, from N to W, so from north to west side? Uh, there's only one bridge. There is also one bridge from center to west, and there's one bridge from west to south. But there are two bridges from center to south. So these are all the bridges of Königsberg. And now we're going to try to figure out if it's possible to cross all of them without crossing the, any one of them twice or more. So what I want you to do at this point is to take a piece of paper and play with this and just draw this, uh, draw this on a piece of paper. While you're doing this, I'm going to just... I'm just going to count uh, two minutes while you're drawing this. At this point, you should have a drawing, and now <clears throat> the exercise is to actually find out if you can do this. So now um, take a couple of minutes, two minutes more, to actually to actually try to walk through Königsberg. Uh, so you pick a starting node, and then you go through the edges. Uh, and your your objective is to see if you can actually solve this problem. Now, it, it is not an easy problem to solve, uh, but I assure you that there is a clever answer to this question. Uh, so, uh, all right, I, I'll have to tell you the answer. The answer is that it's not possible to actually uh, cr walk all the bridges of Königsberg. And despite the many years of efforts, none of the people in Königsberg actually figured out a way. And they couldn't figure out a way because it's not possible to do this. And there is a proof that this is not possible to do. But nevertheless, for the, an exercise, I want you to try to, to write down attempts of proofs. So you can write them down in different ways. <clears throat> you could uh, indicate the initial starting point and then list all the bridges you're crossing. 
So here the bridges are all labeled. So the edges are labeled from one to seven. Uh, so you should be able to try to walk as many bridges as possible before you end up in an impossible situation where you have to cross a bridge twice. <clears throat> so please take, uh, take a minute to do this exercise. All right, wonderful. <clears throat> so let's walk through one solution uh, together. I'm going to try a random solution. I'm going to start in the west part of the city and, uh, and proceed. So uh, we are gonna go, uh, we're going to start from west and then we're going to go south. So that's crossing bridge 5. So from west to, uh, to south, that's crossing bridge uh, 5. All right. So now we have two options, bridge six or seven. It doesn't matter, we actually, we're gonna end up in uh, the center part of the city. And now we are in trouble, why? Because we, we cross, say, bridge seven. If you want to cross bridge six, then we have to go back to south, uh, but then there's no, there's no way of uh, getting back uh, from south. That means that south has to be the final point in our tour. Because, uh, it, because remember, we've been to, to S. We, uh, we crossed, so we started at W. We, we went to S through 5. Then we went from S to center uh, through 7. And now, if you go back to south, we're going to be stuck in south. Because all the bridges we already crossed. Uh, we crossed 5, 6, and 7. So it means that six will be the last bridge we have to cross. All right, so let's now say go through bridge four. So we are now back at W and, and we can now take, the only option is actually to take bridge three. All right, so now we are in north and now we have options one or two. We can take one and it doesn't matter which one we take. So we are now back in C and we cannot solve this problem because the only remaining bridges we have to do are two and six. But if you go two, we, there's no way we can get to bridge six. If we take six, there's no way we can take two. And so we messed up. It's like the Sudoku puzzle where uh, the situation is insolvable. And we have to just go back. And uh, we can go back and back and back. And we will eventually if you have enough patience, we'll realize that this problem does not have a solution. So that's Euler's analysis, and uh, Euler actually has a wonderful proof, it's very short, that shows that, uh, that uh, this problem does not have a solution, and that proof actually relies on the degrees of the nodes. So I'm going to inv invite you to, at, at the end of the lecture, to look at the last slide in the presentation, and uh, and, uh, and see the other solution. If you have questions about that solution, uh, I'm, uh, we can discuss it in the next class. Uh, essentially, Euler established a mathematical foundation. Um, he started drawing graphs like this, and he was the first one to introduce the idea of nodes and edges. Nodes as kind of the unit, and then the edges are the relationships. What are the next steps in the history of network analysis? And I should say that uh, none of all his work is not history because people are still very much doing work of the style of Euler. There's many, many mathematicians who are still continuing uh, to understand abstractly 
uh, this notions of uh, this notions of, of uh, relationships. But um, um, there's been new new people have been start working on network analysis, and their work is very important to this day. <clears throat> the other person is uh, that's kind of one of the founders of network analysis is Stanley Milgram. Milgram is the guy who is famous for many things, but he's very famous in network analysis for posing the degrees of separation problem. So degrees of separation is different from degrees that I talked about before, because degrees that I talked about before is the, is the number of relationships, the number of relationships a person has. For Milgram, Degrees meant number of jumps, number of hops that you go from person to person to person. So for him, degrees is like a chain of, of skips, of jumps that you have to go through. And he asked the following in the 1960s. He asked, how many friendships it will take for a person to reach another person random in the United States? And what he did was, he, uh, he reached out to a few dozen people and asked them to forward a letter to a friend of theirs. I, and, now, and then keep forwarding the letter until they reached a specified person in Boston. So it's a kind of a chain mail that, you, that they, asked, they were asked to do. They were asked to forward the letter to a friend of them. It has to be somebody they knew on the fir on a first first name basis, not just somebody who they know in Boston, you know, some Mr. Smith. They had to fro forward the letter uh, that so that it eventually would reach uh, the person in Boston. So he found some guy in Dakota and said, well, you're going to reach out to find some person you don't know who lives in Boston. And um, what happened was the following. So this guy in Dakota would say, well, uh, my cousin lives in New York, and maybe he knows somebody in Boston. So he sent that letter to his cousin. And that person in New York said, oh, okay, well, I have a friend from college who lives in Boston. Okay, so then the letter reached Boston. And then from there, you know, maybe that he knew something else about the target. The target was, I think, a banker. Uh, who was living in Boston. So eventually that person, that letter got to Boston and then it got into a banker network in Boston and eventually the person was reached. Now, not all of, not all of uh, Milgram's letters have actually reached their targets. Uh, the su success rate was something like 50%. But the letters eventually made it to the target. Made it in f five to six skips. So Milgram hypothesized that the entire country is like this gigantic social networks of very close relationships to each other. And you, everybody in the, eventually knows everybody else through five to six skips. And from there, we, people started studying in sociology network analysis. That was the beginning of network analysis in sociology. Although there's been other sociologists in the 50s who already started collecting network data, trying to understand friendships. I think Milgram was one of the big visionaries. He said that all of the country should be studied as one big social network and inspired a lot of other people to do this. In the 70s, you start to have a flowering of, of network analysis and sociology. And a lot of the research that has been done in network analysis originated in sociology. That's a story in network analysis and sociology, and we're going to uh, revisit some of those ideas uh, frequently, uh, sociological ideas. Uh, six degrees of separation is one of them. There was another idea that came out in the 70s called the uh, weak ties, and uh, this is the idea, uh, this is the question about uh, how do you find a job, and a lot of people find a job through friendships, but it turns out that um, <clears throat> what makes, what is, it's interesting that the, the way people tend to find jobs is not through their cousins uh, uh, or through their close friends. They tend to just know somebody in the particular industry, not very closely. And those are the weak ties. And this became an important area in sociology. And there's other ideas there. 
Something new and interesting happened in the 1990s. <clears throat> in the 1990s, physicists have started looking at networks. Why? That's a very good question. Well, you see, in the 70s, physicists were working on complex systems. You know, complex systems for physicists means some kind of a messy material, maybe like proteins together, or mashed together, or some kind of a complex molecules, uh, or some uh, states of matter. And they started thinking about how social networks and physical systems are like that. They're kind of like states of matter where particles are connected to each other through either chemical bonds or other kinds of bonds. And that's, uh, <clears throat> uh, that's so the introduction of a notion called the small world notion. Uh, there's this pioneering work by Watson Strogatz, uh, who published a paper in Nature, that claimed that social networks have the small world structure. Essentially, uh, <clears throat> what the re they tried to explain why Milgram, uh, despite the fact that why Milgram found that five or six degrees of separation is enough to connect the whole country, they they built a physical model. A kind of, it's a, almost like a it's a kind of a mathematical model, but somewhat less rigorous of how a network might be built on a large scale, and, and this network was called the small world network. We'll talk about it in future lectures. Uh, another uh, area that was became in the 90s, net, uh, infectious diseases uh, people have started becoming interested in networks. Some of them were physicists actually that became interested in infectious diseases, and they started looking at infectious diseases as an inter as an area of networks. And I'll talk about <coughs> okay, they use they study infectious diseases using the paradigm of of infection of, of networks. I will have a separate slide about this shortly. Most recently, <clears throat> network analysis came into a new age, age of big data, age of online social networks. Essentially, in our day and age, we have massive amounts of data, gigabytes and terabytes of data, and that data is often organized into relationships. Facebook, online communities, the structure of all large systems like the internet. All of them have a network structure. And people have been, and current area of research is try to study those structures, how they change over time, not just their connectivity static, but also their changes over time. Because online social networks are changing on all the time. People, people make new friendships. So we need want to understand what causes new friendships to form. How do you make friendships? Uh, there are many people who make money out of making friendships. Um, so LinkedIn, uh, professional social networks, makes money by connecting you to a firm which might look to hire you. So that's the ma major area of research. Big data, online social networks, online uh, systems, large complex systems that are changing in time. <clears throat> Network analysis is very, very important for epidemiology, and uh, one of the a lot of the work that I'm going to present in this course is going to be work in epidemiology. Essentially, network analysis is the core framework for studying all directly transmittable diseases. Trans diseases that go from a person to a person are directly transmittable diseases, and network analysis is a, a lot, gives you the tool to predict a person's risk for in fact getting infected. So clearly, in the case of, a, uh, say, the flu, if a person has more contacts, he is connected to more people, he is at a higher risk of acquiring a disease. In network link, we are going to say that a person who has a higher social degree has a higher probability of being connected. So the social network drives the network that you are seeing on the right, the transmission tree, which is itself a network. So there is an underlying social network, interaction network, uh, not only close relationship, but loose relationships. And th the structure of that network explains how networks like on the right emerge. So the pred predicting the risk of a person is very important. But also, larger scale, we know w if you have an outbreak of a disease, what's going to happen 
Is it going to be a large outbreak or is it going to fizzle out? Is explained by, by the structure of the networks. How people are connected in the particular community is going to be explaining how the disease is going to evolve. Is it going to is it going to uh, break out or not? And also biologically, how the organism might evolve uh, as, a, as a pathogen is going to evolve biologically is actually linked to how the network is connected. But more interestingly, there is this hypothesis that network actually modifies behavior. And it's not hard to see how a network might modify behavior. Um, uh, <clears throat> if I'm hanging out with people who are doing something, I'm likely to either, uh, in some cases, uh, do more of what they're doing or do less because I dislike it. So if I'm friends with smokers, then I might more, I'm more likely to become a smoker myself. If people who are around me are doing uh, dangerous stuff like risky sex, I will be more likely to be doing risky sex myself. There is a very controversial study now going on which is concerned with obesity. There is some evidence that suggests that obesity is a, a disease that spreads through network. Specifically, if a person has more friends who are overweight, he is more likely to become overweight himself or herself. That's very controversial, but nevertheless, there is evidence that networks really are modifying behaviors. And it's very important that there is networks. There's also, epidemiologists are also interested in different kinds of networks. It could be networks that allow, allow the spread of diseases, but they also talk about support networks. Support networks could have a beneficial effect. If, um, if I'm, say, coming out of jail and I need a job, the fact that I have people, friends, and family who can support me is very, very important for predicting what's going to happen to me. And it's going to be very important to make sure that I integrate into society rather than becoming a recidivist. One of the most interesting aspects of how network analysis affected epidemiology is this question of the R0. If you're not in epidemiology, you might not be familiar with R0. So R0 means the number of people, on average, who are going to be infected by a new case of a new, a new disease. So if you have, say, a new strain of influenza that comes around, how many people are going to be infected by a single case, uh, I mean directly infected. So you can see here that for this particular introduction was in, on the right, there was one other case. So that's a situation of where R0 equal to 1. But then the disease, uh, you can see the disease then uh, spread and the, a lot of nodes had a higher degree than 1, other nodes had degree 0. So to calculate R0, you'll have to con conceive of multiple introductions and watch as uh, as the disease is spreading from those multiple introductions. And look at the average number of inf new infections. Uh, epidemiologists view R0 as one of the most important predictive variables for a disease. If a disease has an R0 that's greater than 1, it means that one case will lead to more than one case on average. And then you can see that with every generation of the disease, there's going to be a, an exponentially larger number of cases. So the disease will likely to break out. If R0 is less than 1, then the disease is going to fizzle. So even if you introduced 100 new cases of a disease, those 100 cases in the next generation are going to become 90 cases, and then, say, 80 cases, and so forth. So the disease will really fizzle out. But, but, that does not seem to be true if you think about networks. You see, <clears throat> degree matters a lot. So a node that has high degree, has a lot of social connections, is likely going to affect at least some of them. So even if the disease has, on, and has for some people, or on average, has are not less than one, if you happen to infect a few high degree individuals, then the disease is going gonna, is gonna to infect a lot of people. And there could be even a worse situation, where the high degree people are connected to other high degree people. And then you're not going to, you're going to, even if the disease has very, uh, a low R0, a R0 less than 1, 
In this case, high degree person is going to infect other high degree persons, and then going to infect a high, other, lots of high degree persons. So you're going to have a large outbreak, even though the average or not is going to be less than one. That's a little bit of a paradox. If you really want to disentangle this, you have to really think about how's that network structured. Are the high degree people connected to other high degree people or not? Because if they are connected to high degree people, then you're going to get a very large outbreak, even if they are not as less than one. So that's all I have to tell you a little bit about the history and the motivation for network analysis. Uh, next lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but we're also going to do a lot of math on the board. So next lecture is going to be trying to go get in-depth into some of those questions. I'll introduce all kinds of uh, concept uh, theoretical concepts for network analysis. To set the stage for this course, we now have to turn to something else, so a little bit of a different chapter, which is going to occupy. I'm going to explain this in the next couple of slides. Uh, this is something that I'm going to ask you to do for the next class, and this is to install software for network analysis. Network analysis is, is a very data-intensive discipline, and it requires specialized software, just like to analyze uh, Cartesian data or <coughs> uh, certain other kinds of data. You need specialized software. You might use SAS, you, you might use R to analyze uh, data. You might use special packages to analyze time series data. Similarly, you need specialized software to analyze network data. I distinguish two types of analysis, descriptive analysis and statistical analysis. For descriptive analysis, we're going to use a software called Gephi. So descriptive analysis is concerned with visualization of collecting of basic descriptive statistics about the network, such as the degree of nodes. Statistical analysis is concerned with un finding underlying patterns in the data, and that will require more sophisticated tools. In this course, we're going to use a statistical package called SNA, Social Network Analysis, and it's packaged as part of the R framework. Uh, so uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of our plan. Uh, so for next class, you're gonna, I, I'm going to ask you to uh, get set up with the software. Uh, uh, there's going to be a, there's a listing of data, various network data sets on Blackboard, uh, and I would like you to play with some of this data, download it on your computer, and load it up in Gephi. Uh, for as far as R, all I, uh, we are not going to deal with R next lecture, but you uh, you want to make sure that you know R well, that you are comfortable. Uh, executing commands in R, that you can write simple R scripts, and you have the environment for working with R. Uh, another thing you, you might want to do uh, for fun is to play with your Facebook profile if you're using Facebook. If you, you're using Facebook, there's a couple of utilities which allow, which allow you to actually uh, download your network data, find out, uh, uh, the, explore your own ego network. Remember Ego Network from the first part of my, my class? So you can download that and look at your friends. Look, for example, how they're connected. Uh, do lots of your friends know each other or not? So there are some instructions for downloading this. So you basically have to click on those links and go into that. We're not going to focus very much on, on Facebook because not a lot of people are using it. Our focus is going to be Gephi and R. So what is Gephi? Gephi is a tool for visualizing networks. It's cross-platform, so it, it works on pretty much any computer, uh, whether you're using Mac or Windows, you can get Gephi. You, if you're using Linux, you can also get, use Gephi. It's free, it's open source. It's, it has its shortcomings, I, I'm sh I would say, but it works quite well. And here's a screenshot from, from my computer um, uh, of Gephi running um, a network from Le Miserable. So this is a this is a famous novel from the 19th century. You can see here a display in Gephi of a network uh, from that novel. Essentially, uh, the characters in that novel are represented as nodes, and if people are appearing a lot together, then they're connected by an edge. 
there's a lot of interesting stuff in this network. So the nodes have been labeled into groups. Essentially, people in the same group are tend to be connected to each other. Uh, this node in network analysis lingo, this is known as communities. Uh, they have been pre-labeled, so we know which individuals are in which community, and they refer to certain uh, aspects in the in the story of Le Miserable. Uh, so you get the blues, the greens, the the, the teal, and then Valjean, who is like a, in his own color. I think the, a couple of his friends are also labeled as minor characters. There's also the yellow. Uh, I think that the the size of a node represents uh, the importance of that character in novels. For example, I think it's based on how many scenes the person appeared, or maybe it was the frequency. I honestly don't know how they build this particular network. It could be the frequency in which that particular name appeared in the novel. Uh, the thickness, of, like I said, how frequently was uh, they appeared together in that novel. Okay, so f to for Gephi, uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is to download it from this link and then extract and run Gephi. It might take a few seconds for the software, or maybe like a minute for, for the software to actually start going. And then you can load up different networks. So you load up the Miserable network from Gephi, and you can now ch play with the controls on the left side. Uh, when you play the controls, uh, the network will change. You can also click on individual persons um, notice that the software will take a while to redraw the network and so you can click on refresh on the bottom to redraw the network. Uh, you will have various options for how to lay out the nodes and this is a tricky problem because you, you want to lay out the nodes so everything is kind of spaced out like the communities are on the, each community is in its own part of the picture. Uh, this is going to be tricky and this is known as the layout uh, problem and so you'll have you'll be able to lay out choose a layout for the network and then see how the layout algorithm affects the outcome you can also see the raw data and you can see there is a tab called a data laboratory where you can see the overall data uh, so now play with this a little bit change the visual change the first of all how the network is laid out uh, how the nodes are colored and then look at the raw network data under data laboratory I should say that there's a couple of alternatives if you're using Windows. Um, there is a, a, popular, a couple of popular packages. Uh, Node Excel is a, I think it, it's integrated with uh, Microsoft Excel. UCINet and PyEC are closed software, but they have lots of features. Uh, personally, I, I didn't have a really good experience using them, but you can certainly install both UCINet and uh, PyEC. Uh, Node Excel. Uh, like I said, you, you really have to have Microsoft Excel, and I think you are all, also limited to Windows. Uh, so in this course, we're going to play with Gephi because it's cross-platform. Now, what, is, what about R? <clears throat> R is a very versatile programming language focused on statistical analysis. Uh, you should, as a requirement for this course, you should have basic knowledge of R. So you should be able to know how to write programs in R. You should be able to load packages uh, create data, load data, save data. You should be able to write simple loops, uh, if statements. Uh, you should be familiar with data frames, vectors, lists, uh, all the basic characteristics of using R. I recommend using a particular environment for R called R Studio. It's free and you can download it uh, from this package. So. Um, so your homework for the next couple of lectures, I'm not going to test it, but I think it's an expectation that you will know R, and if you're a little bit soft on R, then I recommend going online and getting working through a couple of basic exercises in R. So that's where, where I'm going to leave you. So you have to uh, make sure that make sure that you know how to how to use R programming. So to summarize, for next class, install Gephi. Load network data for your uh, into Gephi and play with it. Um, install R, uh, or if you want, rec I, my recommendation R Studio. And finally, there is a little bit of a reading. Uh, so we're gonna, uh, it will be very nice uh, to read um, a, a little, little uh, 
very interesting discussion called Four Concepts of Networks, and it's available on Blackboard. There, I, I, I created a discussion uh, thread on Blackboard where we're going to discuss this course, uh, discuss uh, this paper. Uh, this is a philosophical paper that really drives at the question of what is a network paradigm and how seriously we take this. Now, I think this is an advanced paper uh, in the sense that it kind of touches upon uh, a little bit the, the, the nature of the paradigm. Uh, what do we mean by a network and what do you think when we say that the network, there is a network structure? How seriously we take networks? Are networks just an emergent, uh, some kind of a superficial property? Or networks are a mechanism that affects how things are going to be happening in the future? Uh, in this course, one of the things I'm going to look for when I design grades is uh, participation. So uh, I, I would make note as to participation. So uh, this is a way for you to uh, to get participation points, to, to suggest interesting questions and uh, discuss this uh, online. So some mechanics. Uh, what are we going to try to do? There's going to be a midterm exam. Uh, in April on April 17 and you're also going to be asked to do a final analysis project the final analysis project is going to be applications of the concept in this in this class to a project that you are interested in if you have a if you're a graduate student I recommend that you pick a project that's relevant for you something that relates to your research area and do network analysis in that area I will be available to consult you uh, to guide you along to set requirements it's not going to be a very large analysis project, but you're basically going to have to demonstrate familiarity with the concepts, and I hope that you will, and also push certain hypotheses, uh, test certain hypotheses uh, in a very rigorous way with R. Uh, finally, there's going to be participation, and so uh, there's going to be discussions uh, online and in class, uh, computer exercises, uh, we're going to have some computer labs. And finally, uh, there's going to be a, black, a blog on Blackboard. Uh, so this blog is an opportunity for people to post interesting stuff. If you see interesting network-related stuff, post it on Blackboard and uh, comment on other people's posts. So it could be somebody talking about, say, the NSA and the surveillance and what kind of uh, algorithms and ideas they use uh, there. It could be a social network. It could be some insight that people gain, gain about the internet and its structure. It could be an old paper that seems interesting. Uh, certainly don't just post a link. Talk about this. You know, imagine that this is your blog and you want to comment on this. So express your opinion. Uh, speculate. Ask questions. Uh, and post this, this all online. So, today, I told you about the two defining criteria of networks, and uh, you should remember what they are, and why cartoon network is not a network. I also told you about some of the notations uh, of networks, what are some of the other things that might exist in networks, and I gave you a little bit of an overview as to the history of networks and why networks are important for epidemiology. Let me conclude you with a very interesting fun fact. This is a, a surprising and counterintuitive to result, I think. And most people don't believe that this is really true, but nevertheless, this is 100% true. You see, most people have fewer friends than their friends. Let me repeat this again. Most people have fewer friends than their friends. To put it in, la in network language, the degree of most people in their social network is lower than the average degree of their friends. So to understand this idea, you have to think about degree in two ways. Uh, is a degree of is an ego, and the average degree of the other people you're connected to. So you measure your personal degree. And then you go to every one of your friends and find out how many friends they have. This is easy to do in today's work. Well, for most people, their degree is lower than their average degree of their friends. So, in some sense, 
they should be they should feel humbled by uh, by their friends and this is true this is true for most people and the reason for this is very interesting and this is, the reason for that is something that I'm going to explain in the next class that's all I got for you scroll to the next slide for uh, showing the solution to the bridges of Königsberg and and then uh, see you in a week see you in class at SPH 10th floor room 1001 thank you very much